In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Howdy. It's been a while since we did a vlog, so I thought I'd do one. It's the 16th of Iyar, e and uh, Shabbat Shalom. I've been having a romp through the Orthodox internet, especially through social media, podcasts, and whatnot. Not to, not out of nostalgia um, or to justify anything in my Byzantine Catholic experience right now, but rather to see what I might have missed. Um, when I began my journey in the Orthodox Church, I was drawn in by, among other things, the writings of Seraphim Rose, who has a, uh, a very split, he's, he's a very polarizing person amongst a certain crowd of people he's 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 nearly canonized and he seems to have been actually among the serbs and the georgians um, but amongst another crowd of people he is just a nut job and uh, to be frank those same people generally feel the same way in those divided camps or at least at the time when i entered the church in 2002 uh, I felt the same way about St. John Maximovich, uh, the royal martyrs of Russia, and, and other things. So you could generally split people into camps of progressive and uh, tratty, if you will. And um, after 20 years or so, it's not 25 at all, but after 20 years or so, things have calmed down somewhat. And... Uh, much like in the Catholic Church, the younger crowd seems to be leaning tratty. Thank God. Uh, I, think, I think they're going to need it as much as the Catholics will in the coming storm. But um, what, what interests me in the orthodox social media that I've been exploring has been... Um, this group of people who are very devoted to Sarah from Rose and who seem to be, um, how shall I say this, uh, retrograde. I, I, I don't mean that in a bad way, so I'm trying not to say the wrong things. Um, and it's a glory to, to listen to, to engage with mentally. Uh, they challenge things and it's wonderful. And that's, it's, they challenge things and it's wonderful that I'd like to talk about. When, when I was outside of the church in my college years and my, my, my 20s and 30s, um, I became enamored myself of the works of one writer, Robert Anton Wilson. And um, while he seems occultish to many people, um, his overall, his overall pattern of writing was, uh, what do you really know? And if you can't say what you really know, then all you can say at best is, uh, what I am doing is based on what I know. He said, you can't say it's based on what is true because you don't know what's true. Now, as a Christian, I disagree with that final premise. But his exercises, if you will, his spiritual exercises, were designed to trick the person into just trying on different things of beliefs and seeing if they worked. And, you know, is the world flat? Is the world round? Does thinking one way or the other affect your experience of the world? Is the world occupied by uh, things called viruses? Or is the world occupied by uh, invisible vertebrates of unknown heft, uh, i.e. ghosts? Um, is, is our flying saucers real? Or are they something that, that we need to be worried about? Or are they something that we need to be welcoming to all of these different things um, Anton Wilson uh, described as reality tunnels. 
and we put ourselves in reality tunnels by our own choice, but we sometimes forget that we did that. And I'm going to step away from Robert Anton Wilson for a moment and go to C.S. Lewis, surprise. And uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, just before his death, and I believe the book was actually published posthumously, or it may have been the last book he, he published, uh, wrote a book called The Discarded Image, uh, which was an introduction to medieval literature. And it is super important, n not because you need to read it in order to understand Chaucer, but rather if you don't understand the cosmology in which Chaucer was writing, you actually won't understand everything about Chaucer. You might understand the surface. You might have a grasp of the storyline. You might have an understanding of the meaning of Juana de Aprila with the Shora Suota, but you won't actually understand why. And in the introduction to that book, he describes two different types of, of consumers of literature whom he parallels with two different types of tourists. And he recognizes that there are some tourists who will pour over maps, who will decide what they're doing, where they're going, what they need to do. And even though they know that when they get to where they're going, they won't be able to just stick their head in the map and actually enjoy things. They'll have to get up and look around. But they'll have this deeper, richer understanding. And then he compares them humorously to the other type of tourist. Uh, um, and they say that there is just as many travelers who carry the resolute Englishry with them all over the continent mix only with other English tourists, enjoy all that they see for its quaintness, and have no wish to realize those ways of life, those churches, those vineyards mean to the natives. They have their reward. In other words, they go to see quaintness and they get it, and how charming, and then they come home, and they never actually left their Englishry anywhere. And Lewis suggests that it might be better to, now going back to Anton Wilson, to enter into the reality tunnel of those people. I remember the first time I read Discarded Image, um, I picked it up at Moe's Bookstore in Berkeley, and I went, oh, this is very interesting. And I got outside, and, and I had been shopping with friends, and uh, much like the kids in Charlie Brown's uh, Halloween special, we opened up our bags and showed what we got in Trick or Treat. And I pulled out Discarded Image, and, and a friend of mine said, oh, what's that? And I said, well, this is what I've learned from reading the outside cover. And she goes, hmm, perhaps it's a good thing that image was discarded. I disagree. Um, lest you think I'm going back to some kind of flat earth or whatever, I'm not. But for example, um, one of the church fathers, Ephraim the Syrian, described the world this way. There's a firmament overhead in which we find the sun and the moon and the stars. And paradise is outside as that firmament comes down and touches the earth. And then there's a vast abyss filled with water. And in the middle of the water, a tower is rising up, a mountain. And that's the world we know. That tower, that mountain in the middle. But when our parents, our first parents were in paradise, they were outside on this rim and when they fell they fell off that rim onto the mountain that's an interesting image it doesn't have to be true to be true in in another one of his stories in the the voyage of the dawn treader c.s lewis has one of his characters meet a star 
and the star says introduces himself and says i am a star and the character says well in my world stars are just big balls of flaming gas and the star says even in your world that's only what they're made of that's not what they are and so we live in a world that we think we understand and um, some of the orthodox folks that i've been listening to uh, deny the lunar landings say that space and gravity and einstein's relativity are all demonic plots and you know what their worldview is more consistent with christianity than mine is and so i'm intrigued by that not in a let me go become a nut job kind of way i don't think they're nut jobs though I think they're trying to live in a world that is affected by their faith. And this is actually what I think is the quest for what Catholic seminarians refer to as fundamental theology. Uh, if what we describe is true, if what we describe in theology is true, then how does that affect the world? And more importantly, how does that affect the way we see the world? M one of the arguments that I've, I've listened to on, on a blog, and I, I will link in the show notes, um, the, the folks that I've been reading and whatnot, um, one of the things that has come up is these vast expanses of numbers and in interstellar space, et cetera, et cetera, what C.S. Lewis called the bogeyman of big numbers. Um, that all comes up from people who not only want nothing to do with the church, but tend to deny it, deny the truth that we teach. Now, that doesn't mean that they're wrong because any truth is truth. But the reality is we can't prove it. Um, you know, when you point a, a spectrograph at a distant star and say, well, it appears that it's made out of iron and, I don't know, gold, um, and all of that iron and gold is burning, there's no way to prove that. There is no way to prove that. By proof, I mean go there and say, aha, I was right. The scientific method does not work if you cannot do experiments and verify them with actual scientific evidence. And the evidence is not found in saying, oh, I know what that light spectrum means. Um, proof is not found in mathematical computations. Proof is found in evidence. So, I'm, I was taught this in school. As C.S. Lewis says, what are they teaching in school nowadays? Um, so, it's been interesting to enter this reality tunnel and see essentially the claims of fundamental theology lived out in a real way by it's, it's orthodoxy, so mostly men trying to experience the world within the reality tunnel that they are being given by the faith of the church. Now, does the faith of the church require one to believe in evolution or not? I don't have an answer to that. Um, I know C.S. Lewis accepted evolution, and I know Seraphim Rose did not. I know some priests who are, some Orthodox priests who are literal six-day creationists and young earthers, to use a, the tagline. But there's no way to prove it any more than there is a way to prove the bazillion-year-old evolutionary model. Um, all we have to go on is what we've been told. And therefore, that reality tunnel is more in keeping 
with the church. So, I don't know. It seems to me to be uh, to have a more valid claim on my brain space than um, than Bill Nye the Science Guy. I'm okay with that. Um, let's sing. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestow holy life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestow holy life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestow holy life. Christ is risen.